Good evening everyone, my name is Audrey Simmons, I'm one of the organisers for London Black Atheists in this event today. We've got Clive over there doing the technics, we've got Lola who's also one of the um, organisers for London Black Atheists and we have our guest speakers. So first of all I want to welcome you, I see new faces, fresh blood, we love it when new people come along. If you don't know us, follow us on Meetup, you'll find out exactly what we're doing. And by the way, that was our old name, London Black Atheist. London Black Atheist? Yes. I'm having some kind of retro moment. Oh my gosh. Thank you for making me up. Association of Black Humanists. Thank you. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. It's just sort of in a moment there. Um, Something I'm regressing, I don't know what's happening. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, it's a Friday, it's dry, and I know we don't do that, but we've got to do something. Um, um, so just to kind of introduce the, the evening, Professor Cameron, thank you for contacting us, and he's, he's over here doing some, some talks, and he's joined us here tonight. So for those of you who don't know, I'll tell you a little bit, I'll let you introduce yourself. Find that people who know themselves do it better than anything because we end up rattling off all kinds of stuff. But um, he's an associate professor of um, history at the University of North Carolina. He's a founder of the African American Inte Intellectual History Society and he's the author of um, To Plead Our Case, um, an African American in Massachusetts and the Making of the Anti Slavery Movement. I was looking you up. We do modern day things, and I happened to look on the rate your professor, and I happened to see that some of the complaints of the mm -hmm. students oh, there you you've got too many books oh, no. on your course, mm -hmm. too many books on a history course, which I found quite funny, and that they said that you like to do quizzes. I hope there are no quizzes tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Um, I mean, also, so what we're going to, just to give you a layer of the, um, of the, the proceedings, Professor Cameron is going to give us a little bit of talk, um, and then we have S.I. Martin here, who's going to do a little bit of an interview, a little bit of a back and forth, just to kind of open up the evening, and then we're going to open it up to you. So do come with your questions. We don't take people just sitting here looking, or as lovely as you are. We need your input to make this night a really good night. So, um, without further ado, I am going to hand over to you, and um, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Audrey, and thank you all for being here. I'm really excited to, uh, to talk about my uh, last book uh, with you, Black Free Thinkers, The History of African American Secularism, which I published uh, four years ago. Like Audrey said, I'm a history professor at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. Um, got my PhD at UNC Chapel Hill, and broadly speaking, I'm a scholar of uh, African American religious and intellectual history, um, as well as a scholar of slavery and abolitionism. So, um, I, I started working on uh, this book, Black Free Thinkers, in uh, late 2012. Um, I became an atheist. Um, it was kind of a gradual process that occurred in uh, my PhD program starting around 2007, probably by 2010 or so I was identifying as an atheist. Um, and around uh, early 2012, um, I started just looking for secular community, right? Um, and as young people uh, do, I started looking online. <laughs> Um, and so I found, you know, various um, groups like Black Nonbelievers, um, African Americans for Humanism, um, and some of these, uh, some of their websites had profiles of individual African American atheists, um, and that really started to kind of pique my interest. I had just finished up working on my first book, uh, which looked at sort of the intersections of Puritan theology and Black abolitionist thought um, in the 18th century. Um, and so I was looking for a new book project uh, at the time, um, and, uh, and encountering these kind of individual profiles of black atheists, I started to look for uh, what scholarship existed on the history of uh, African American secularism. And I was pretty surprised to find that there wasn't really any, right? There was uh, some works by Tony Penn, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, in theology, um, but you know, as a theologian, he's he's interested in 
kind of constructing a, a secular humanist theology, but not necessarily uh, interested so much in exploring the historical trajectory of free thought and the contextual, social, political, and economic factors um, that contributed to it, right? And, and I found that historians just hadn't done it. So for me, this book really emerged out of a confluence of my own profession, my own sort of personal identity and personal interests and passions um, as a secularist, but also just the sort of um, professional need to write more books, right, as a history professor. Um, and that, that was really good because, uh, you know, my first book was fine and, you know, I enjoyed writing it. Um, but I wasn't nearly as passionate about that as I was about this project, right? Th this just never really seemed like work for me. Traveling to archives and reading about black atheists and then writing about them, it, it was just a pleasure. So I started that in uh, 2012, published the book in 2019. Um, and where I kind of started my research was in looking at atheism in the slave community. When I first began doing my research, I went back to works on African American religious history to see maybe if some of them had written a little bit about black secularists. And um, very few had, uh, of course, but um, the uh, religious studies scholar Al Rabito, who recently passed away, wrote a groundbreaking book um, back in 1979 called Slave Religion. And in most of the book, he explores the uh, development of a kind of uh, syncretic um, um, African and uh, Christian sort of tradition uh, in America. But at the very end of the book, he has a couple of paragraphs where he says, you know, of course, not all slaves believed in the notion of a just and benevolent God. Some couldn't reconcile their lives in bondage with that idea. He doesn't go into any depth, right? It's only like two or three paragraphs. I was like, I wonder what's going on here. So I went from Rabito to the primary sources, right? I went and I started to read through narratives of enslaved people. And um, these narratives have been used by historians and scholars of religion to great extent to document the black religious experience in, in all of its different forms, um, iterations of evangelical Protestantism, African traditions, Islam, and the like. Um, but what I found when I started reading through you know, dozens of them was that they also spoke to the presence of atheism in um, 18th, late 18th and uh, 19th century slave communities. And scholars just really hadn't necessarily picked up on that. Right, um, and, and in reading these narratives, I found that secularism in the United States really developed along kind of two different paths, right? Uh, among white free thinkers, deists like Thomas Paine and Thomas Jefferson and uh, Ethan Allen and, and others, Fanny Wright. Um, deism really emerged out of Enlightenment philosophy um, and out of liberal Christianity right, in the late 18th century uh, and really started to kind of take off uh, in the U.S. Um, in the 1820s, became more popular among the working classes then. Um, but that, that's sort of the primary origins of deism and just secularism in general in, in the United States among white free thinkers. But for the slave community, it kind of goes back to that little line from Al Rabito, right, that um, African Americans started to embrace atheism uh, and other forms of secularism, not so much through an engagement with Enlightenment philosophy, although if they had been, you know, permitted to read um, by their masters, that might have been the case, but uh, due to restrictions on slave literacy, they weren't able to engage with Enlightenment thought and Enlightenment philosophy. Their path towards uh, free thought really came through uh, observing the world around them by reflecting on their condition and kind of just reasoning their way towards atheism, right, without the help uh, of European philosophers. And that, that reasoning basically took the form of um, looking at their lives, looking at the physical and sexual abuse that they uh, endured at the hands of uh, their enslavers, the fact that they were being separated from their families, 
and kind of thinking about the people who told them that there is a just and loving and benevolent God who is looking out for their interests, who cares for them, and uh, who wants to see them in heaven, right? And they just basically came to the conclusion that that was BS, um, that they couldn't believe in that, and they uh, decided that um, there was no God, right? Um, based off of their lives and based off of their everyday experiences. So that's one kind of um, foundation of atheism among African Americans, is this um, reflection on the brutality uh, of the institution of slavery. One enslaved man named um, Austin Stewart, wrote, a formerly enslaved man, wrote a narrative called 22 Years a Slave and 40 Years a Free Man. Um, and he, um, in this narrative, he was reflecting on a brutal whipping that his master was administering to his sister on a Sabbath morning. And he was um, very clear, he pointed out multiple times, probably three or four times that this occurred on the Sabbath. Um, and after sort of talking about that, he asked, can anyone wonder that I and other slaves often doubted the sincerity of every white man's religion? Can it be a matter of astonishment that slaves often feel there is no just God for the poor African, right? So this speaks to that sort of uh, relationship between the brutality of slavery and the development um, of secularism and free thought um, on plantations. Another foundation of it was the fact that many um, enslavers did not want uh, their uh, enslaved people to practice Christianity, to learn about Christianity. Now some did, some saw Christianity as a sort of pacifying religion, right, and they would bring in ministers to <coughs> preach to their slaves not to lie and steal and cheat and all of that. But others kind of saw the potential liberatory messages uh, of the Bible and they didn't want their enslaved people um, to be exposed to that, right. Um, so that became another sort of foundation, just a lack of exposure uh, to Christianity, right? And one enslaved man named Charles Ball, who in 1837 published a narrative entitled Slavery in the United States, uh, kind of speaks to this as well as a sort of uh, widespread disregard for religion. He writes, there is in general very little sense of religious obligation or duty amongst the slaves on the cotton plantations, and Christianity cannot be, with propriety, called the religion of these people. They have not the slightest religious regard for the Sabbath day, and their masters make no efforts to impress them with the least respect for this sacred institution. So that's a kind of second key foundation uh, of the rise of atheism among African Americans. The third that I'll point out is um, sort of kind of a combination of uh, hypocritical Christianity and pro-slavery religion, right? So individuals like Frederick Douglass and Harriet Jacobs in their slave narratives, they point out the fact that um, both of their masters went to uh, Methodist revivals during the 1830s. And they both thought that after their masters came back and were converted and, and born again Christians, that they would uh, be better masters. They would, you know, stop separating families and stop whipping slaves and maybe actually feed them uh, enough food. But uh, Jacobs and Douglas both note that the exact opposite happened, that they became worse after their conversion. And Douglas says now they had a religious justification uh, for their cruelty, right? Um, and, and so this kind of went along in the 1830s with the rise of pro-slavery religion or basically using Christian theology um, to justify and, and strengthen the institution of slavery. And that in itself was a response to um, a sort of rising tide of abolitionist sentiment um, during that same time, right? So prior to the 1830s, when there wasn't as robust an abolitionist movement, um, enslavers didn't necessarily feel the need to come up with these robust uh, and systematic defenses of slavery. That starts to change in the 1830s. And so when enslaved people are hearing their masters using religious language and using Christianity to justify their bondage, that's something else that, of course, would turn them away uh, from that religion. 
Now, not all enslaved people. Plenty of enslaved people sort of said that they're not true Christians or they're not practicing the Christianity that I am. But others, uh, the ones that I study, um, just disregarded Christianity altogether. Now, um, generally what we have during the era of slavery is um, uh, atheism uh, and not necessarily humanism. And that's because enslaved people just didn't have the physical capacity to practice humanism, right? To engage in um, behaviors that would help to improve their world because they're trying to make it day to day, right? They're just trying to um, get through and, um, you know, scrape by whatever freedom they can in their daily lives and eventually gain um, their, uh, their physical freedom for themselves and for their families, right? But when those uh, enslaved people who were able to run away and, and um, become free, like Douglas uh, and others, made it to the north, that's when you start to see the development of, uh, or the move from kind of strictly atheism on the plantations toward uh, humanism, right? And individuals like uh, Douglas or William Wells Brown uh, in engaging in the anti-slavery movement, becoming parts of the women's rights movement, and other kind of um, movements for social justice, labor, um, economic justice, uh, and the like. Um, and that's a trend that would really continue into uh, the 20th century with the rise of the Harlem Renaissance, or what many scholars are now calling uh, the New Negro Renaissance, to indicate that this wasn't just a kind of Harlem thing, but was something that occurred throughout the United States, the Caribbean, um, the Negritude movement um, in France and the French Caribbean. Um, and the like, right? So in, in the United States, though, the Harlem Renaissance um, would become sort of a watershed moment in the history of black secularism, right? And um, there are a few different reasons for this. One, um, the Harlem Renaissance sort of coincided with the Great Migration out of the rural South. So between 1915 and 1930, approximately a million and a half black southerners moved from rural areas um, to the urban north, cities like Chicago and Detroit and New York and, and Philadelphia and the like. Um, and that becomes a really, really significant moment for black secularism because a, a lot of individuals um, who were sort of uh, an isolated free thinker in their small rural southern communities could now go to a city like New York or a city like Chicago, um, a more uh, urban cosmopolitan area where they have access to higher education, um, but where they also are able to build networks with other like-minded people, right? So a couple of examples. Langston Hughes, um, prominent writer of the Harlem Renaissance, um, grew up in a small town in Missouri called Joplin, right? Um, and he writes in his um, autobiography, uh, The Big C, that um, he came to disbelieve in God when he was about 13 or 14 years old, right? But there was a lot of pressure in his small, tight-knit black community to kind of conform, right? And to sort of toe the line. So he wasn't really open about it until he got to Harlem in the early 1920s. Zora Neale Hurston is another case in point. She grew up in um, Eatonville, Florida, and she was the daughter of the local minister, right, a, a Baptist minister. Um, she writes in her autobiography, Dust Tracks on a Road, that she also started to question the idea of God at a very young age, even before she was 10 years old. Um, and she says, I, I uh, didn't dare to share these critiques or questions with anybody out of fear of ostracization. Right, from her community, um, as well as probably just fear of what her parents would think of her as well. Right, um, So she can't be open about her, her non-belief, but when she moves to Harlem in the mid-1920s, now she's around folks like Langston Hughes uh, and others, and she's able to sort of build more of a secular community. Right. Access to higher education was also really key. So Langston Hughes attended Columbia University for a time, didn't graduate. Um, Zora Neale Hurston also went to Columbia University. She got a bachelor's degree and a master's in anthropology, and she worked with um, her advisor for her master's was a prominent white freethinker, Franz Boas, right? 
Um, so access to these higher educational institutions was also key, as were um, publishing opportunities that arose during the Harlem Renaissance, right? With people investing in black artists and black writers, with the rise of um, publications where African Americans could place their works. Uh, the Crisis Magazine was a really important one. This was the um, journal of the NAACP, and it just so happened to be edited by the black free thinker W.E.B. Du Bois, leading black intellectual uh, in the 20th century, and he was a socialist and an agnostic, right? So he was sort of open to publishing some of these works. Um, and even just the patronage of, um, uh, of both uh, prominent whites and blacks supporting uh, black authors was also really key. So this moment of the Harlem Renaissance, you really see a flowering of black secular writing, right? Um, and some of the first uh, novels, for example, that explore uh, secular themes. Um, one of these was Quicksand, published by Nella Larson um, in 1928. Um, short novel. Uh, she was one of the first African-American women novelists um, and the first to uh, explore in depth, or really explore at all, um, kind of questions of, of secularism in combination with gender, right? Um, and that was sort of really, really innovative. Um, so uh, Quicksand focuses on a woman, it's basically an autobiographical novel, it focuses on a woman named Helga Crane, um, who starts off um, at a, uh, uh, she's teaching at a school called Naxos, um, in the South, an anagram of Saxon, um, and this is basically a, a composite of Fisk and Tuskegee universities, both institutions that Larson herself worked at. And Helga Crane begins by sort of articulating her dissatisfaction um, with religion at the school and the way that religion is sort of intertwined with the curriculum and with the culture of the school. Um, early in the novel, there's a white minister who comes in to preach uh, and this is a HBCU, so uh, there's a white minister comes in to preach to the black students, um, and he's saying, you know, you guys are really good. You're, you're better than those other Negroes elsewhere in the United States because you know your place. You don't advocate politically. You're just trying to get an education, work a job, basically the educational philosophy of Booker T. Washington, right? Don't agitate politically or, or call for equal rights. Just get your industrial education, get a job, and don't make any waves, right? And this white minister was praising um, the uh, black people at Naxos for this. And Helga Crane had enough. She quit. She went to Chicago, um, thought she might be able to develop a life for herself there. And she started to try to build community in churches, right? And she was spurned. Um, by the middle-class black people in these churches. So another really negative kind of um, encounter with religion. She then goes to Harlem, goes to Europe for a little bit, comes back to Harlem, ends up making a really rash and rushed decision to marry a revivalist uh, preacher, um, and moves to Alabama. Uh, and this is kind of based off of Larson's in-laws, right? Uh, they really weren't happy about this. Um, she moved, Helga Crane moves to Alabama uh, with this preacher, um, marries him, has four kids in three years, um, and after the fourth child is uh, almost on her deathbed and is reflecting on her life and she feels like she's made a huge mistake in marrying this man that she really doesn't love and in sort of settling down into sort of middle class domesticity and she blames it all uh, on religion, right, and, and starts to really harshly critique religion. Um, and reviewers of the book at the time and friends of Larson, everybody knew that this was sort of her ideas and her own thoughts on religion, but she's able to sort of use the form of the novel as a little bit of cloak and cover, right, um, just in case. Um, so that, that was a sort of really pivotal moment in the history of sort of black secular writing, and it's part of, like I said, a sort of flowering of black secular literature that includes Langston Hughes's um, poetry, his autobiography, Zora Neale Hurston's autobiography, Dust Tracks on a Road, where um, she articulates a sort of deist slash agnostic um, position and um, argues that uh, people 
Um, in fact, I have a quote from her here. I'll just read this. People need religion because the great masses fear life and its consequences. Its responsibilities weigh heavy. Feeling a weakness in the face of great forces, men seek an alliance with an omnipotence to bolster up their feelings of weakness, even though the omnipotence they rely upon is a creature of their own minds. Um, so here I think she's drawing from um, probably some of her studies in philosophy at Columbia University. Uh, it really seems like she read Ludwig Feuerbach's uh, 1841 book, The Essence of Christianity, where he makes this kind of very same argument that human beings created God uh, and not the other way around. Um, but there's also a little hint of uh, Nietzsche's philosophy about Christianity being a sort of religion uh, of the weak, right? Um, so uh, we see some of the most prominent um, well-known black writers of the Harlem Renaissance embracing secularism uh, and various forms of free thought um, during this era. Now at the same time we also see the um, kind of intersections of black secular thought and um, socialism and communism, right? Um, during the same period, uh, 19-teens through the 1930s. Um, since its inception in the 1830s, uh, among German and French intellectuals in um, the 19th century, socialism and communism has been tied to atheism, right? Marx, Engels, Lenin, uh, and Stalin. Um, the Comintern, the Communist International, put out a directive in 1926, basically saying they expect uh, communists across the world uh, to be atheists. Um, and African Americans started to increasingly be drawn to socialism and communism um, because of the revolutionary nature um, of communism especially and the sort of anti-imperialist politics of socialist uh, and communist. They likewise appreciated the support um, that communists especially in the 1930s gave to um, issues of racial justice and civil rights. So one of these was um, the defense of the Scottsboro Boys in Alabama in the early 1930s. These were uh, nine African-American men con uh, falsely convicted uh, of raping a white woman. Um, and the Communist Party was sort of front and center um, in raising money for their defense and supporting their families even before uh, organizations like the NAACP uh, or the National Urban League. And that was just a really effective recruiting tool uh, for the communists, right? And then once African Americans sort of embraced socialism or communism, then they started to sort of move towards um, secularism, right? And sort of um, turn away from religion. Others were already uh, atheists or agnostics, uh, and that made a sort of secular political alternative um, to Republicans and Democrats much more attractive to them, right? So some of the leading kind of black intellectuals uh, and activists of the 1920s and 1930s were both communists uh, and free thinkers. Some of these included Louise Thompson Patterson, um, uh, Harry Haywood was another, the individual who articulated uh, the Black Belt thesis, basically that African Americans are a nation within a nation and they have the right to self-determination just like other countries uh, around the globe, right? W.E.B. Du Bois was a socialist for about 40 years or so, so from the 1890s from his time in Germany up through the 1930s after visiting Russia a couple of times, he kind of transitioned uh, from socialism to communism. Uh, another really prominent one was uh, Hubert Harrison, who was known as the father of black radicalism. Some of you might have encountered uh, Jeffrey Perry's uh, wonderful biographies of Hubert Harrison. Uh, Perry also has a really great collection um, of Harrison's writings. Um, Hubert Harrison uh, was uh, right up there in terms of his sort of intellectual stature with W.E.B. Du Bois, except he was uh, what uh, scholars refer to as an organic intellectual, right? Kind of self-educated, uh, didn't necessarily have the PhD or anything, but whenever he spoke, lots of people listened, right? He was a stepladder orator uh, in Harlem, would just climb up on a soapbox or a stepladder or something and start talking, and crowds would just gather around him. And he, he traveled all around uh, New York City primarily, um, speaking on um, political and economic issues as well as uh, secular issues. 
um, for Harrison and other black communists uh, and free thinkers, they combined um, their secularism with a sort of staunch anti-imperialist and anti-capitalist politics, right? Uh, and for them, their critique of capitalism went hand in hand with their critique of Christianity, right? And they felt that Christianity and global capitalism kind of supported one another um, in promoting uh, imperialism and racism, both in the United States uh, and in Africa, right? Hubert Harrison saw himself as something akin to a black Thomas Paine, right? Somebody who could bring uh, free thought to the masses of African Americans, right? Using um, sort of plainer language uh, than more philosophically inclined um, free thinkers like Elaine Locke or, or W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, he wrote in an article in the uh, free thought magazine, The Truth Seeker, that it should seem that Negroes of all Americans would be found in the free thought fold since they have suffered more than any other class of Americans from the dubious blessings of Christianity. So for Harrison, um, he, he had a similar kind of critique of Christianity as enslaved people did uh, in the 19th century. But for the enslaved, it was based on their own personal experience. For Hubert Harrison, it was based off of his reading of those experiences, right? His reading of slave narratives and his knowledge of the history of slavery and the way that it was supported by pro-slavery religion. <coughs> Another really prominent kind of um, atheist and uh, communist uh, black freethinker was Richard Wright, um, who uh, the author of Native Son, um, a number of other works. Uh, in his autobiography, Black Boy, published in 1945, really the central theme of the first part of his autobiography is his move towards um, atheism and secularism. And what really, really surprised me uh, about Richard Wright, I read through all of the like literary critiques and analyses of his works, and it was just so surprising to not find discussions from literary scholars of his atheism, right? When I combined that with my own reading of his autobiography, I just couldn't believe that they ignored what seemed to me to be the central theme of part one of Black Boy. Um, so he discusses, you know, growing up um, in Mississippi uh, with his grandmother and with his aunt, who are both Seventh-day Adventists, um, and all of, all of the kind of conflicts that he had with them uh, over religion, really feeling ostracized and like an outsider uh, in his own home. And he really also speaks to the intense community pressure that African Americans feel to sort of uh, toe the Christian line, right? There's one scene where um, he's, uh, he's basically been forced by his family to attend a revival service. He's up on the mourner's bench and other people have uh, kind of accepted Jesus and, and converted to Christianity and he's just sitting up there kind of stoic and his mother is in front of him basically crying and pleading like, won't you come to Jesus? Uh, Richard, don't you love your mother? Don't you love your family? With the implication that like Christian conversion goes hand in hand uh, with the love of your family and with being a part of this community, right? Um, and the odd thing is, it was at that moment that he decided, no, I can't believe in any of this, right? Um, and he writes in his autobiography, if there did ex exist an all-wise and all-powerful God who knew the beginning and end of this world, this God would surely know that I doubted his existence and he would laugh at my foolish denial of him. And if there was no God at all, then why all the commotion? I could not imagine God pausing in his guidance of unimaginably vast worlds to bother with me. So sort of an atheist or sort of an agnostic perspective, but also a deist one, right? I don't really think there's a God, but if there is, it, that God isn't really concerned with us puny human beings, right? Very similar perspective as Zora Neale Hurston uh, in Dust Tracks um, and an agnostic. Um, he writes in multiple uh, essays in the Crisis Magazine, in personal letters um, to uh, his friend Herbert Apthecker and other people uh, about his atheism um, and agnosticism. In his autobiography, he wrote, I do not believe in an afterlife, in otherworldliness. The experiences of this world are too potent and too much with me. 
Also, he wrote, I do not see how any Negro can believe in another world, and the religion which has inspired him to that belief, if it has saved him, has done so by making him content with the very degradation of his humanity that is so abhorrent to the principles of Christianity. So it's kind of like the um, enslavers of the 19th century who believe that Christianity, uh, for their enslaved people, was a sort of pacifying force, right? Um, du Bois says the same thing. Langston Hughes said a very similar thing um, in his, uh, in his uh, poem, Song for a Dark Girl. Um, now, W.E. Du Bois really spans um, like the last three chapters of my book, because he lived such a long life, right? He lived from 1968 or 1868 until 1963. So um, just uh, right at that, was born right after the abolition of slavery, uh, lived through Reconstruction, the rise of Jim Crow, the Harlem Renaissance, played a key role in the Harlem Renaissance, uh, was a communi uh, communist, so was part of the sort of origins of the black radical tradition and then would pass away sort of as the civil rights movement uh, was getting into full swing. Um, and the civil rights movement was another uh, really interesting component for me to research um, because most, if not all, historical scholarship on this movement portrays it as a religious movement, right? The black church is really key and really central and foundational uh, in the civil rights movement. Um, but there's one book I came across by a um, historian named Barbara Savage um, called The Politics of Black Religion, where um, she notes that, you know, uh, while we portray the civil rights movement as an overly religious one, the reality is that most um, black churches in this era were conservative and that less, less than 10% of black churches participated in open civil rights organizing. And she, she has this really funny line where she says the, uh, the very fact that we've come to see the civil rights movement as a religious one is a miracle in and of itself, right? Um, and so reading um, Savage's uh, Politics of Black Religion provided something of a jumping off point for me, right? So I started to, say, uh, to look at, you know, who are the really prominent activists and intellectuals uh, of the civil rights movement, let me go and read their autobiographies. Let me start reading some of their letters, and and see, um, you know, if, if this typical portrayal of civil rights really bears out. Um, and I found that it did not. Right. Uh, in looking at both the traditional uh, so-called Christian wing of the civil rights movement, as well as looking at uh, the sort of rise of Black Power and the Black Panther Party in the mid-1960s. So looking at the kind of traditional wing of the civil rights movement, organizations like the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, um, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, um, we can see even in that traditional wing that um, secular, secular thinkers and leaders were really prominent in that organization, right? So the first president um, of SNCC was um, John Lewis, uh, recently passed away representative. He was very Christian, very religious, but the um, person who uh, succeeded him uh, as President Stokely Carmichael was an atheist, right? Uh, he became an atheist during uh, his teenage years attending the Bronx High School of Science, right? He had migrated uh, to the Bronx from um, Trinidad uh, when he was 10 years old. Um, at Bronx High School of Science, he was really good friends with a Jewish um, communist kid named Gene Dennis, um, and he embraced atheism at a very early age, right? Uh, another really prominent um, uh, leader of SNCC, the, the, not the president, but the executive director was James Foreman, right? Um, and in the 1970s, he wrote an autobiography, The Making of Black Revolutionaries. Um, and kind of uh, like Richard Wright, he details his path towards atheism, right? He also grew up in Mississippi, um, lived with his grandmother as well there, uh, felt the sort of same communal pressures to convert, and um, this is a sort of common trope in uh, Langston Hughes's writing, Hurston's, Richard Wright's, and then James Foreman, where you see them up on the mourner's bench, um, and the moment that they're supposed to convert to Christianity, that actually becomes the moment where they sort of see the facade of this whole thing. And some of them fake it, 
right? And they say, mm -hmm. yes, Lord, I'm saved and all of that. Um, but they write later on, you know, sometimes 20, 30 years later, that that was the moment where they actually became atheists, right? Mm -hmm. uh, is up on the mourner's bench when they, um, when they were supposed to become Christians. And James Foreman would write in The Making of Black Revolutionaries um, something very similar to Du Bois, right? That he felt the belief in God had hurt his people and had made them sort of look to the next world for salvation instead of working to achieve sort of heaven on earth, if you will, right? Um, and for him, his political philosophy grew out of his atheist and humanist perspective, right? Um, so like many free thinkers that I talk about in my book, uh, for them, their secularism was not lack of belief in God, right? Many of you in here, uh, if not all of you kind of know this, that it's not just you don't believe in God, but you take that lack of belief and then apply it um, to other areas of your life, right? That's the sort of beginning, not the end point as Christians might want to portray it, right? And for James Foreman and, and Stokely Carmichael um, and, and others, that lack of belief in God pushed them uh, to develop a sort of humanist politics and to build organizations where they could do for themselves and build up uh, their own communities. The uh, kind of key organization for them was the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, uh, founded in 1966 by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale in Oakland, California. Um, so the Black Panther Party basically represented the sort of institutional uh, expression of calls for black power, right, which started uh, in Mississippi in the 1960s, called for basically black political and economic self-determination, and the Black Panther Party was a sort of organized political expression of that philosophy, right, and it was started by free thinkers. Uh, Huey Newton was the son um, of a minister, um, and he started to move away from religion after taking philosophy courses uh, at Merritt College in Oakland. Um, and he writes in his own autobiography, Revolutionary Suicide, that his move away from religion sort of inspired his humanist politics, right? Um, and his sense that black people have to sort of organize and do for themselves, right? And that was behind uh, one of the most successful programs of the Black Panther Party, uh, the Free Breakfast Program for Children, which was basically nationwide, um, really very, very successful, right? The Black Panther Party, um, in addition to the Free Breakfast Program, they would uh, um, organize health clinics, um, uh, they would provide armed self-defense training, uh, job training, and legal defense, right? Um, what, and it wasn't just the sort of leadership of the Black Panther Party, but a lot of the rank and file rejected the ethics of Christianity as well as the sort of nonviolent philosophy of that uh, quote unquote traditional wing um, of the civil rights movement. And they embraced uh, calls for armed self defense. Also, um, the uh, newspaper of the Black Panther Party, which was titled The Black Panther, became um, a, a way to spread secular thought, right? So black women such as Sarah Webster Fabio and Yvette Pearson wrote essays and poems in the Black Panther newspaper um, that uh, sort of articulated a humanist um, sensibility and a humanist politics, right? So this became sort of uh, one of the first kind of black um, secular publications. Um, and I'll end by talking about the black arts movement uh, very briefly. So uh, the Black Panther Party was the sort of political wing of black power. The black arts movement became sort of a cultural expression of the philosophy of black power. It spanned roughly 1965 uh, to 1976 and the black arts movement um, aimed to promote black cultural nationalism an appreciation of African culture um, and uh, a rejection of respectability politics, especially in um, black literature. And some of the key writers of uh, the black arts movement, including Lorraine Hansberry and James Baldwin, were atheists. And they used their um, both fictional and nonfiction writings 
um, to, uh, to promote their um, sort of atheist perspectives uh, and their humanist politics, right? Um, so for Baldwin, The Fire Next Time, um, his 1963 book, uh, he talks about his sort of religious path from being um, a young minister. Uh, he became a um, Pentecostal minister when he was like 13, 14 years old, did that for three years, and then he, he writes that one day he was 17 years old and he was up preaching in front of this congregation, and he writes, it took everything I had to... Um, to um, tell them to get up off their knees and to go and organize a rent strike or, or to basically do something, anything, instead of just kneeling down uh, and praying, right? Uh, and that, for him, was the end of his belief in uh, Christianity and his belief in God, right? Uh, Lorraine Hansberry uh, uses her play A Raisin Under the Sun, as well as her um, autobiography to be young, gifted, and black, um, to sort of state her own kind of growing uh, atheist sensibility, which began uh, when she moved to Harlem in the 1950s. And we see this from another, a number of other uh, black writers in this period, including uh, Nikki Giovanni, uh, for example. Um, so just to kind of finish up, uh, despite views of African Americans as sort of naturally religious, which has been very prominent in not only historical literature, but uh, African American uh, popular culture and American popular culture more broadly. Secularism has really been um, a vital and significant component of black culture and black politics since uh, the 19th century. And this, is a, this is not really an obscure history, right? A lot of the people that I've been talking about tonight, you probably have heard of them, right? Um, probably have read some of their works, but you know, for me, um, growing up in the States, um, you know, I might have read Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God, but nobody, uh, you know, uh, signed her autobiography or some of her other uh, secular writings. Same thing with Langston Hughes. We read The Negro Speaks of Rivers, um, but we didn't read Song for a Dark Girl where he's critiquing Christianity and sort of conflating it uh, with the rise of lynching in America. So th this is a history that is sort of readily available in, in print sources. Uh, and online, all of the slave narratives that I read, I got from a website called Documenting the American South, uh, which is hosted by the institution I went to graduate school uh, at UNC um, Chapel Hill. And I think it's really vital to understand and teach this history today, especially to show black skeptics in the U.S. Um, that, you know, they don't have to feel isolated. Right, that they're part of a long and storied tradition of prominent black freethinkers who've been some of the most important leaders uh, and intellectuals in African American and in American history. Thank you. Was a lot. <laughs> there was a whole lot there. So I hope you've got your questions ready. We've got some snacks and some drinks and stuff. If we just want to take a five minute comfort break, just to give a bit of time, do you know what I mean? The bathroom's just there. Um, help yourselves. There's rum punch. The red stuff is rum punch. No drive drinking and driving. I'm just saying. Okay. So do help yourselves and um, then we'll come back again and we'll have SI Martin and talking to, to Christopher Cameron. So, okay, just five minutes. Just take a comfort. So there's just some apple juice, some orange juice, and the rum punch. Thank there's you. Some nuts, some crisps, and things. I made the cookies myself. Just come and go. Just go ahead. Just come and go. No. Oh, no, no, go ahead. I made the cookies. Um, we'll try to whistle out the. Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. So yeah. So Christopher. Yeah. This is. I, 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 I was watching in um, your presentation. I just thought it was absolutely fantastic. This is the sort of stuff which is so seldom um, put forward and shared, especially in the way you've done it. Um, and I wasn't joking when I was saying, as a compliment, how precisely and politely you write about what I think are really emotive subjects. And um, just to go back to the um, the start of your arguments, one of the things I really like, and I like the phrase as well, you use about the beginnings of um, black scepticism or questioning, is that you said that people were reasoning their way towards atheism. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just a great way 
um, to introduce this subject because um, at the same time, I, I noticed there's this huge divergence between, you could say, the African-American tradition. We can see that clear reasoning one's way towards um, atheism. And I contrast that to the uh, black British um, uh, slave narrative tradition, for want of a much better word, where that um, those sort of expressions or objections to organized religion are, with one notable exception of Lord Robert Wedderburn, we would have time to go into it if you want to, <laughs> but I warn you. <laughs> but with one noticeable exception, it's just not there. Yeah. I mean, you have you know, your um, Britton Hammonds, your Alada Equianos, John Gears, etc. Cubuano. Yeah. Massively, profusely, uh, drowningly Christian. And you mentioned as well the vector through which a lot of these texts reached a majority white readership. So my question, <laughs> I, will, I will land, my question here is um, how did these um, objections to Christianity or the question of Christianity, how did it appear in, say, the writings of what, Austin Stewart or William Wells Brown? How did they get past the censors? Really yeah, um, so a lot of the evidence that we have for the rise of black skepticism in slave communities is kind of second-hand evidence, right? And, and that's the way that it, that it got published and that it made it past um, the sort of uh, you were right to say white censors, right? Because mm -hmm. they basically had to get this uh, approved by white publishers uh, and the like, and, and people who are underwriting some of these projects. And so, what folks like Stewart and uh, Harriet Jacobs and, and a lot of mm -hmm. slave authors did is they didn't necessarily talk about their own lack of belief. And some of them were actually believers, but they were commenting on this sort of widespread development in slave communities, right? And for me, it, it was enough um, evidence when I looked at kind of the dozens of, of comments I saw to this effect, even though they weren't necessarily talking about their own experience, I felt like I had enough there um, to, to really make the argument that, that this was something. And, but I didn't want to stop with, with these sort of secondhand accounts. So I went to some other types of sources like travel narratives. Mm -hmm of ministers who had come down south. Um, one was Daniel Payne, uh, bishop of the AME Church. Another was the individual who I started off the introduction with, a white minister named Charles Colcock Jones. And so you see a lot of travelers to the south also commenting on this very same development, right? And they're listening to enslaved people uh, articulating the same reasons as these slave narrators, right? There are a few exceptions to that sort of second-hand account. Uh, one is William Wells Brown, who is one person that does talk about his own um, growing non-belief. And another is Frederick Douglass. Um, they're not super, super overt about it, right? Douglass kind of couches his growing skepticism um, in, in sort of subtle language, but you know you, you can see it there, right? Um, so, so it's basically just kind of a confluence of all of this uh, sort of secondhand evidence that made me, um, you know, feel I could confidently argue there really is something to this notion of uh, a kind of divergent path uh, for for African American secularism. And I use that term um, that that you started with, reasoning their way towards atheism. Um, intentionally because I, I want to make sure that we remember that even though these people uh, by and large were not literate and were not able to because of the broader kind of uh, legal um, context they weren't able to engage with enlightenment philosophy and enlightenment thought that doesn't mean they weren't intelligent right um, they, they still possess reason and they still could use that um, to kind of come to the same conclusions as others did uh, through writings um, and for them, um, the, the interesting thing you see is uh, free thought among whites in, prior to the Civil War largely took the form of deism. And many deists still identify it as Christians or as believers, right? I mean, a component of deism is that there is a God, just not providentially involved in human life. Whereas atheism actually develops among African Americans earlier than among whites.
I was going to stay on literature, but I'm just going to swerve off a bit here um, to follow on with what you're saying. So post-Civil War, um, what would you would you say that there was any sort of uh, cross fertilization between um, black non-believers and writers such as uh, Colonel Robert Ingersoll? Yeah, uh, there, there definitely was. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. absolutely. Yep. So uh, Frederick Douglass was friends with Robert Ingersoll. Um, and so uh, certainly was influenced by and probably influenced Ingersoll. Um, one uh, individual who I talk about towards the end of chapter one in particular was really influenced by Robert Ingersoll, a man named David Sincor. He was a former Baptist preacher um, turned atheist, and he saw himself uh, kind of similar to Hubert Harrison would later as a, a sort of atheist minister. He was kind of continuing his ministry, but now he's trying to convert people away from Christianity instead of to Christianity. And he traveled around the country talking to black people and, and trying to spread um, the, the good news of atheism, right? Um, and, and he was actually referred to in uh, like the Truth Seeker and, and other white secular publications as the Black Bob Ingersoll, right? So there's him, there's an uh, individual named R.S. King uh, out in San Francisco in the Bay Area that attended uh, atheist conferences um, and gatherings. So yeah, this was certainly um, uh, kind of influential among um, African Americans, uh, Ingersoll's example. You also have people who I didn't discuss in Black Freethinkers, but who I'm sort of learning more about in the course of my book now on Black UUs, who were members of Unitarian churches uh, and uh, atheists as well. So one really prominent one was Fanny Barrier Williams, and I, I wish I had known that she was a free thinker when I was writing this, because um, it would have been gold. Most of the people I talk about in chapter one are men, right? Because that, that's just the overwhelming number, of, or overwhelming majority of slave narratives are written by men. Um, but Fanny Barrier Williams uh, grew up um, in upstate New York in a largely white community. Uh, hers was the only black family in town. Uh, because there weren't a lot of numbers, uh, white people didn't really feel threatened by her family. So she, they, it was basically integrated. You know, she was accepted by this community. She says that she didn't really experience racism, but then she becomes a teacher, goes down to Missouri um, to teach him on um, black population there and encounters racism in Jim Crow, right, um, in the 1870s. And that turned her away from Christianity. She grew up Baptist, uh, was religious, um, but once she experienced uh, Southern racism, which sort of went hand in hand uh, with Southern Christianity, she said, you know, I couldn't believe in the religion that I'd grown up with anymore, right? Took her a little bit, but she uh, eventually came to Unitarianism, and the church that she joined in Chicago, um, the first Unitarian church, uh, was led by a, a deist and free thinker named Jenkin Lloyd-Jones. And we have a number of writings from um, Fanny Barrier Williams, where she refers to herself and to other um, middle class educated blacks in Chicago as free thinkers, and says that you know Christianity is not very common among my sort of social and intellectual circles. So now I'm kind of busy not only researching her, but trying to figure out who else w was in her circle, right, um, and who else was attending that that Unitarian church there. Yeah, I, one of the extraordinary things that um, I took from your book was the um, um, high number of women that were involved, the sort of um, <clears throat> um, joining of, um, by many practitioners, male and female, of um, atheism and uh, feminism, um, at a very, at an, uh, well, at a surprisingly early uh, period as well. But just the sheer numbers of women, mm -hmm. um, especially given the whole African American context, where um, I'm given to understand that uh, women are seen as the carriers of culture yeah. and they're very central to the function of the church. Um, mm -hmm. You know. And this is replicated in era after era. Mm -hmm. um, the baton is passed on, you know, seamlessly even to today. You know, you've got well, Siku Vu, Hutchinson, Mandisa Thomas. Yeah. Um, a lot of very, very high profile African American non believers are women. Why is this? Um, 
Well, uh, it's because they recognize the sort of way that Christianity has been used to uh, basically reinforce and support patriarchy in the United States, right? And that was kind of a key theme of Nella Larson's Quicksand. Yes. Also, some of Zora Neale Hurston's anthropological writings, her book of Mules and Men, um, kind of talks about that tie. As well as, you know, if you really read their eyes or are watching God closely, it's sort of a feminist critique of um, Christianity and of the notion of middle class domesticity, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Janie, a uh, central character in that, basically rejects her grandmother's sort of, uh, eventually rejects her grandmother's path to just marry a good uh, Christian black boy and, you know, have a couple of kids and live happily ever after. Like, that, that just wasn't for her. She did it for a while, but she was miserable the entire time, right? Uh, and then ran off with her much younger lover towards the end of the novel, right? Um, he passes away, but you know, at the end she's single and she feels like very liberated, right? Outside of the bounds of, of domesticity. And so for me, I was very intentional in, in trying to make this a really balanced assessment of both male and female black secularism, largely because of reading the works of Sakibu Hutchinson, right? Reading Moral Combat and Godless Americana, and she references a couple of these historical black woman atheists and and I wanted to try to present as balanced an approach as I could and I was also just really intrigued um, by those ties between uh, feminism and secularism and you know one of the things we see with a figure like Louise Thompson Patterson or or Zora Neale Hurston is um, you know really the origins of black feminist yeah. thought right which historians and um, black studies scholars have generally attributed its rise in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And we see that sort of intersectional critique of race, class, and gender oppression in the writings of Louise Thompson Patterson, in the writings of Zora Neale Hurston yeah. in the 1930s, yeah. right? 40 years before most scholars argue black feminism was even a thing. Okay, so I just want to uh, say going back to um, literature on the back of what you just said. Um, because I have to say, I mean, I'm talking as well, I have to disclose as a um, <coughs> recovering writer, um, when you were talking about the um, Harlem Renaissance, um, I was sort of scratching my chin a little bit because I think you made a very clear uh, case between the link to the African American women writers and um, African American styles of feminism, parts of feminism in general. I think that's a clear baton that's been passed. But I don't really understand, I don't really get how that. Um, secular baton, the atheist baton, was passed on from, um, say, Langston Hughes um, and Alan Locke, people of that ilk, um, to, I mean, did it really underpin the socialism that was to follow, or the civil rights movement? Because to my understanding, although I love a lot of the writing, um, I'd agree, trigger warnings coming up, people, <laughs> I would agree that um, it was to a degree um, bourgeois piffle mm -hmm. and um, it was written by, you know, they were, we'll call them the niggerati, but it seemed removed from the lives of uh, people you know, involved in that great migration and um, uh, socialism um, and um, mm -hmm. non-belief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah um, I wasn't necessarily trying to make the case for um, Harlem Renaissance literature um, and the sort of secular themes there kind of diffusing down to the masses of the people, yes. but more the case that um, here we see a sort of particular moment in time where um, we just have an explosion of black secular writing. Okay. It doesn't necessarily lead to like the creation of a lot of black secular organizations, although we do see some black political organizations uh, where secularists play a really prominent role, like the African Blood Brotherhood, uh, for example, um, and their, um, their journal, The Crusader, right? But it's really significant because later black secularists would sort of look back 
uh, on a lot of these writings and be sort of influenced by them. And um, that, that's sort of how I start off chapter four, right, with um, Stokely Carmichael in the 1950s going down to Harlem to get his hair cut because uh, he lived in a largely uh, Jewish neighborhood in the Bronx and encountering black radical thinkers and activists who had been around uh, doing their thing in the 1920s and were still around Harlem in the 1950s as like step ladder orators uh, and the like, right? So you, you do kind of see that connection, not so much with the masses of black people accepting secularism, that, that really never happened. It, it's starting to change over the past decade or so, right? Uh, it didn't really happen in the 20th century, but you do see um, the kind of intellectual ties between that kind of, the kind of smaller groups of folks in the 20s and 30s who are influencing and forming folks in the 1960s, and you would see black secularism becoming more widespread, right? Mm -hmm. Especially with the Black Panther Party. Click. Okay. Um, one of the things which um, is on my mind a lot is um, the positioning of uh, black non-believers, skeptics, atheists, etc. Um, because, and I'm asking you to be a prophet rather than a historian now, because um, a lot of the um, fault lines, and by extension the front lines of uh, religious conflict, have become, particularly in the United Kingdom, racialized mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, if we're dealing with basic humanist <coughs> um, um, golden calves like, um, uh, say, um, gender rights, sorry, um, uh, gay rights, women's rights, um, religion in schools, in public assemblies, all of these things, they have become definitely, optically, um, racialized mm -hmm. along racial lines. Um, I'm sort of certain, I suspect, I might just believe that the same thing is happening in the United States. And my question really to you, uh, my last question, is um, are the uh, are black um, humanists and skeptics properly positioned to deal with that in the United States? Because I don't think that's the case here mm -hmm. yet. I, I think so. Um, I, I think the dynamics in the U.S. are a lot different in that um, you know the the kind of culture wars that we have there. Um, mm -hmm. African Americans actually line up on very different sides of people with whom they share similar theological beliefs, right? Mm -hmm. So even kind of conservative black Christians will support, support the right to get an abortion, right? Um, or support mm -hmm. gay rights or something like that, whereas that's not necessarily the case among conservative uh, white evangelical Christians. Yeah. So by and large, black Christians overwhelmingly um, vote for and uh, support liberal political policies, right? Um, so, so yeah, I think it's a, a slightly different dynamic where you know, black humanists and secularists politically make common cause with, with black Christians, um, even pretty uh, conservative black Christians. Um, against maybe uh, even or definitely against those black secularists who or those white secularists who support more kind of conservative political uh, and cultural policies. Yeah, that's an interesting answer because I mean <clears throat> I think um, this is one of the major issues. Yeah, that it is. I think a major issue of um, humanist work in the UK right now. And my final final question, guaranteed, is. Um, <laughs> it's not funny at all, but we are living in an era of, you know, just multiple black theologies, mm -hmm. um, increasingly diverse and ludicrous, um, where um, there is a gradual, very slow migration away from the established uh, big to Islam and former Christianity, but it's just morphing into congregations who believe they're Israelites, <laughs> congregations who believe they're Egyptians. Yeah, the Coptic <laughs> Church. <laughs> oh, you know. Yep, yep. Um, how do you handle all of that? 
Are you going to be writing about any of this? Um, you know, I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> so my my, I'm, I might I might. So for the next seven or eight years or so, I'm going to be working on African Americans and Unitarian Universalism. I'm writing uh, after I finish that. I'm going to write a short history of humanism in the United States, and then I'm going to write a companion volume to Black Freethinkers. So this You're book, so organized. Um, <laughs> the right the, this book goes up to the civil rights era, so it ends around 1975. I initially intended to have another chapter taking the story to 2020. When I started collecting source materials and started outlining that chapter. I saw it was just going to be too unwieldy. Like the manuscript of chapter four was already 70 pages, and I had like twice as much material for what was going to be chapter five. So I decided I'm just going to cut it off at chapter four. I have enough for a book, right? And then I'll write a second volume uh, exploring black secularism from 1975 up to 2020. And there are, there are some different themes and new directions that the story goes into, right? We see the... Um, kind of more formal institutionalization of black secularism in the 1980s uh, and in, um, uh, in the early 2010s, right? The creation of African Americans for Humanism, um, Black Atheists of America, Black Nonbelievers Incorporated. So previously, we'd had atheists who were situated within black radical political organizations like the African Blood Brotherhood or the Black Panther Party. But now we start to get specifically black secular organizations. And we have a growing number of black secular folks uh, in the 1980s. So it starts to seep more into hip hop and black popular culture. And we see intersections with like comedy and, and stuff like that. So yeah, there's just so much rich material for that kind of 45, 50 year period after the civil rights movement. So that's, that's what I'll be on for the rest of the, the 2020s. Um, I kind of have an idea um, after that of writing a book on religion and black power. Um, so that's one that would be a lot more expansive and it wouldn't just be looking at um, secularism or, or black you use, but would be looking at the way that black power sort of informed African American religion more broadly. Because during um, the mid 1960s, you would see um, 10 black caucuses created in uh, within Protestant churches, right? Black Presbyterians, and um, there's a black Unitarian Universalist caucus, and, and others, right? Um, so I kind of want to, I'm interested in sort of exploring that sort of broader religious development um, and perhaps also looking at the, the sort of rise of, um, of sort of more African traditional religions uh, during the 1960s as well and how that's related to black power. But that's sort of a long term project and who knows if, if something else is going to come up before then. But, I'll definitely do the black you use and the companion to, to black free thinkers. Well, Christopher, it's an absolute pleasure to start this conversation. <laughs> and uh, start this conversation with you. And I wish you happy writing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs>
sort of religiosity of the black scholars who are, who are writing on, uh, or lo largely black scholars who are writing on African American history, right? Yeah. Um, and sort of kind of like me as an atheist, interested in atheist stuff, a lot of them are interested in kind of traditional uh, religions and how that informed African American history. But another is the sort of political project of African American history, right? Which um, emerged as a sort of distinct field in uh, the mid 19th century with the goal of furthering the black freedom struggle, right? Um, and, and with the goal of sort of using history as a political tool to make the case for racial equality, right? That African Americans are deserving of citizenship and worthy of respect and, uh, and the like. Um, and since that was a kind of key function of African American history from its inception, focusing on things that would have been seen as the kind of underside or the negative elements within black culture, namely atheism or communism or uh, other things like that, um, that, that's something that wouldn't have helped the cause, right? So I think a lot of people just, you know, even if they encountered some of this stuff um, that I explore in this book, um, decided not to include it, right? Um, because it, it would have sort of hurt the, the sort of political cause of black history, right? Great stuff. Is there any more questions? Mark, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> You're up. I do that all the time, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, my first question was taken. Thank you. <laughs> that was the obvious one. So um, my backup question is, um, given how sort of unknown so many of these people are outside of these circles, um, and even within a sort of humanist circles as well at times, how do you see um, a broader education of not just the choir, as it were, mm -hmm. but to the sort of pop broader population in general, especially within the United States? Yeah. Um, so, uh, Audrey mentioned um, in, our, in our introduction that I started this organization called the African American Intellectual History Society. Um, I began that first as a group blog uh, that's called Black Perspectives, um, and it's uh, the, basically the most prominent blog within the discipline of history now. Um, gets about 20,000 unique readers a day, not a lot for some websites, but for an academic one, quite a bit, right? And so I, I, I you know, published pieces uh, from this book leading up to and after um, I, I wrote the book. I published pieces there. Um, I do a lot of like podcasts and stuff, which will have, a, a, I think, a much wider audience um, than, than this book. Um, and also, I really want to do a documentary uh, on black free thinkers, which I, I think I'll probably work on as I'm getting into to writing the second volume. Um, and, you know, as I can also apply for some funding and grants um, to, to make that happen. Um, but yeah, something akin to Henry Louis Gates's Many Rivers to Cross, except uh, for, for black atheists. Thank you. Great stuff. Any more questions? Yeah, that's the, you know, I, I don't know if I misheard you, I don't think I did, but um, towards the end you said that the uh, white secularists and uh, free thinkers and so on in America are more conservatively inclined than the black. Oh, no, no not necessarily, but so, you know, some are, right? So there's, uh, you know... Um, there's some blacks as well, presumably. Uh, yeah, much, yeah. Of course, smaller, yeah? Yeah, yeah, okay. much, much smaller percentage, yeah. yeah. But there, there is a kind of divide in the white secular community in the United mm -hmm. States um, a, a political divide where some just uh, either don't feel that atheism has anything to do with politics or their atheism kind of pushes them more towards libertarianism and, and conservatism, yes. right? Yeah. Um, so for, for that group, you know, black secularists don't necessarily make common cause with them over a shared theology or, or lack of theology, right? Um, but more with African Americans who, even though they don't share their religious beliefs, um, kind of share their political orientations. Yeah. yeah. And the history, of course. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, that, I mean, that has been an issue because uh, you see um, historically a lot of kind of segregation and, um, in the secular community and 
Uh, that, I mean, that's what led uh, Norm Allen Jr. to create a group like African Americans for Humanism, right? Because he felt that um, white secularists were um, either not particularly welcoming or some were just not really concerned with the issues um, that, that black secularists were. I mean, not just the not campaigners. I had a problem, uh, which I'm not really specific about, in the 1990s, went to Conway Hall and I found absolutely no sport whatsoever. You found what? A place called Conway Hall in central London, the, mm -hmm. the completely in tune with the Christian establishment of this country. There's not at all in some campaigning for, uh, you know, uh, reasons. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Thanks anyway. Thank yep. you. Good talk, by the way. Thank you. Wow. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much for your, your talk. Um, so I, I was really interested in what you, what you had to say about sort of, you know, countering the narrative that I would have, would have uh, sort of you know, traditionally sort of understood about uh, the prevalence of, of Christians amongst uh, 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 civil rights activists and, you know, others involved, other African Americans involved in resistance mm -hmm. to racism. But, but I just wondered, well, two things really was, one is, can you, in a sense, quantify, you know, the, the extent to which the leadership, at least, and the, and the sort of key activists would have been um, atheist and, and, you know, related, you know, communist and, and, and socialist. And, and, and also, um, I was intrigued by what you were sort of hinting about the relationship between them and the the more and the, and the, the churches, the more religiously inspired people, and mm -hmm. what you said about you know how only ten percent of the churches actually were involved in the uh, black churches were involved in uh, yeah. civil rights. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it, it's hard to to quantify it, but you can say that in the Black Panther Party probably like 95% of the leadership was secular, right? Uh, at the national and at the local levels. Um, but I do want to be clear that I'm not, I'm not necessarily making the case that um, religion wasn't significant in the civil rights movement, because it, it certainly was, right? Um, but it's, it's that the civil rights movement wasn't only religious, right? Or completely dominated by religious folks. And, and that's the story. That, that we've been missing, right? Mm -hmm. that, that importance of key secular thinkers um, in political organizations or in cultural organizations in the black arts movement um, that we've just kind of completely discounted this whole group of people. And they might not have been as numerous uh, as the Martin Luther Kings and, and um, Fannie Lou Hamers uh, and the like, but they were still critically important because they were leading some of the key civil rights organizations, right? AJ. Thanks. Could you give a sense of how, or the state of black free thought at the moment, or mm -hmm. sort of in the past few decades, the magazine you mentioned, The Truth Seeker, is that still going? The Black Free Thought magazine? Th that's not a black free thought magazine. Oh. That, that's just a general free thought. That's like okay. the longest secular publication a running secular publication in the United States. Um, so that was uh, created in the 1870s mm -hmm. um, and is, is still going today. But many black free thought. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of black free thinkers have published in it, um, including myself, a couple of, a couple of pieces uh, from, from this book. Um, but so the trajectory over the past few years is that roughly, I think it's, something like 15 or 16 percent of African Americans now identify as nuns. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're all, all those nuns are atheists or agnostics, but that they just have no particular religious identification. But that is significant because it's doubled mm -hmm. in the past decade, right? Mm -hmm. and, it, and it shows, I think, a, a good trend, right? Even with um, the evangelical Pentecostal rise on the other side, they yep. still managed to grow a bit. Yep, yeah, yep. So, um, largely among the youth and, yeah. and the educated youth. Um, but, uh, so things are sort of trending towards secularism being more prominent among African Americans, even though they still identify as the most religious group um, in the United States. Tala. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Christopher. Quite a good lecture and really in a, quite insightful. But this is just a personal one. Do you think Obama was actually a closet atheist or secularist? Because a lot of people say he probably may not be a Christian, but probably played into it obviously to get elected. But what's your take on that? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I do think he's probably secular. Um, mm -hmm. And I think he's smart enough to know that you're not going to get elected to any major <laughs> office in the United States if you are open about any type of um, mm -hmm. religious skepticism or, or lack of belief. Um, mm -hmm. I actually think, uh, even though he would claim otherwise, that um, or that Donald Trump was an atheist. Um, he, he doesn't seem religious at all. I mean, he bows to the religious right and pretends that he's religious uh, and all of that, but I, I think he's an atheist. Um, he's he, he, he an abortionist. He's an abortionist. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but because that's because he hates women. women. <laughs> okay, well, you know, I think, I think two Corinthians kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm a bit strange. The one about Trump is strange. I don't know what the guy. I think he goes anywhere to do, he'll say anything. I mean, he's just obviously not he's true. not. But even he's clever enough to know that he should oh, hide his. Oh, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he could be anywhere for all that. Like, yeah. He's gone to the far right. He's gone to mm. people who basically want to see the United States turn back into the 19th century or something. So mm -hmm. I don't you know. But yeah, I think, I think his religion is just all a show. Mm -hmm. um, and, well, to a certain extent, Obama too. I mean, he might he might not necessarily be an atheist, but I don't think he's like as religious as he oh, portrays, right? Mm -hmm. And I think he made a very calculated decision to join mm -hmm. Jeremiah Wright's church when his political career was starting in Chicago, because if you're in the black community mm -hmm. and trying to make any headway politically, the first thing that folks are going to ask you is, where's your church? Mm -hmm. You know. So, I, um, I just wanted to know, from your research, is atheism in the African-American community mostly to do with fighting against the oppression and having that relationship and correlation to the oppressor? Or is it coming from a general disbelief in God, because historically, Africans, before becoming enslaved, are do believe in God from mm -hmm. the continent. Yeah, yeah. So where did the, was it did the oppression that made that thought disappear, or they just generally don't believe in religion at all? Mm -hmm. Because I know the focus is mostly Christianity, yeah. not believing mm -hmm. in you know, the white man's God. Yeah. So. yeah. Uh, it, it's a mixture, and it, it really depends on, on who you're looking at, right? So some uh, come to atheism and secularism as a sort of political critique of Christianity and the function that it served in black communities. Others come to it, like um, Harry Haywood, um, prominent black communist and atheist. He, he says that he was reading, um, uh, he was actually reading some of the works of Ingersoll, Robert Ingersoll, uh, in the US, um, the great agnostic. And so he was kind of convinced by his more kind of secular arguments. It wasn't necessarily political for him at first, but then he would end up becoming a prominent communist and the like. Um, for some, it's, it's kind of both at the same time, right? It's, it's the political critique um, of Christianity, but also just a lack of belief in any God. Um, but you are right that others have this kind of critique of Christianity, and that pushes them more back towards uh, traditional African religions, right? Or like something like voodoo or... Um, or, or conjure or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. For, for example, I'm, you know, like I was saying, I'm half Jamaican, half Nigerian. Mm -hmm. And I was born a, a Christian. Yep. But, you know, as I grew up and, you know, do my research and, you know, not just seeing what religion has done on the continent to the people, the mindset. I mean, for every, you know, uh, 10 churches, you have like maybe one school, mm -hmm. if that, yeah. you know. So, but instead of, you know, becoming an atheist, personally, I went back to, you know, my traditional religion, which is, I'm Igbo. Yeah. So I believe in Chukobi, I mean, which is just basically Supreme God. Mm -hmm. So I just, you know, so when you go back to what you were saying, instead of, you know, I just wanted to understand, instead of putting away from God completely, you know, why not return back to maybe the origin? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so... Yeah, and the people that I'm looking at in this book, a lot, a lot of them just weren't really conversant with African traditions, mm -hmm. right? Um, a lot of the enslaved people were third, fourth, fifth generation, so they were pretty removed um, mm -hmm. from kind of traditional African religions. Mm -hmm. So it probably just didn't necessarily occur to them as an option. And then same thing for the folks 
uh, in the 20th century, but during the black um, power era, that is where you start to see a lot of individuals kind of turning back to African religions, Yoruba religions and, uh, and the like, um, changing their names from their, their Western names and, and adopting African names. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've got Lola and then Clive. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Lola, then Clive. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think my question goes back to how you started and when you said um, atheism was, wasn't from any philosophical, any um, uh, no connection with the European enlightenment or any. And I'm thinking a lot about um, even contemporary humanist groups everywhere, um, whether in America or in Europe, even in Africa, they, they tend to be middle class. And I'm wondering, because um, I, I don't think, you know, questioning religion, questioning God, questioning whatever we've been um, taught, I don't think it needs to come from any, any um, because I keep on going on about this. I've been talking about this for, for, for a long time. It doesn't have to come from anything, you know, highly sophisticated. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that we are, I, I don't know how we are going to connect with the masses when we keep on being so academic and, you know, and it's something that I think a lot, and I don't know the answer. Because there are a lot of people there, out there. I, I see them on TikTok, and they just, it's, it's just simple. It doesn't take anything, it doesn't, it doesn't take anything deep to work it out. That it's not adding up. But how do, how do we, how do we connect to, um, you know, to the masses? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Sakiko Hutchinson talks about this in her um, book, Godless Americana, um, and, and she notes that, you know, the reason that African Americans are, um, you know, the most religious population in the United States and continue to sort of attend and, and adhere to Christian churches is because these churches serve an important function in these communities, mm -hmm. right? functions that are lacking from the state, right? Um, they provide um, job training, they help out with scholarships for schools and do tutoring and um, provide like social support and prisoner re-entry programs. A, a lot of services that should be carried out by the state, right? Um, and, and the case she makes, and I think it's a convincing one, is that you know, until secular organizations stop focusing so mm -hmm. much on the separation of church and state, the teaching of evolution in <laughs> schools, mm -hmm. and start focusing on, like, the real-world problems that people have in the same way that churches do, they're not going to make a lot mm -hmm. of headway, right, among the masses, right? Mm -hmm. And you're right. It isn't that, you know, most people can't, you know, um, see the problems with Christianity and the like. But if their churches are serving these really critical <coughs> functions in their communities and they're not able to get that from, you know, the Freedom From Religion Foundation or the American Humanist Association, then they're not going to go to those, right? Um, but if those organizations do start to sort of take on some of the functions of black churches, right, and really embed themselves uh, within black communities and speak to issues that are important, uh, to everyday people, then they'll start to make more headway, right? And it's not going to work by being dismissive of black religion or like criticizing black people for being religious. It's going gonna, it's gonna to work by just getting in there and, and doing the work and just showing up, right? Um, and, and speaking to these really critically important issues. The conversation that we have at, um, at ABH all the time. This is the conversation that we have. Clive, I'm going to bring you in. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I'm I'm just wondering because uh, there's one person who did a lot for the civil rights movement, um, and I'm, I'm not sure where he stood himself. 
personally in terms of religion, faith and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, this was a guy called Sorry. Bayard Rustin. Um, so he, I know he helped Martin Luther King, for, for example, um, to become the prominent person that he, he became. Mm -hmm. And uh, he did a, a, a whole lot of uh, uh, good stuff like helping to organize that uh, march to Washington for jobs and mm -hmm. so on and so forth, you know, but did he write a lot? Did he say much? Did he, where, where did he stand? I, I haven't, I didn't do a lot of research on him because yeah. when I, when I started to read a little bit about him, I found he was a Quaker and, and a believer. So mm -hmm. to me that sort of placed him outside of the bounds of people I was trying to explore here. Although in my book on liberal religion and race in America, I will sort of include him as, as somebody who, yes, was a believer, but believed in kind of non-traditional forms of Christianity that are sort of often portrayed and seen as outside of the bounds of orthodoxy. Mm. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily call him secular, but certainly a, a, an important religious liberal. I'm going to say something now. I was wanting to think about your point. I was sitting here thinking about the kind of audience that we at um, ABH try to get hold of. And the black population, and I know this is the same in America, in turning away from religion, have become more looking back at their African. And we seem to be, I think because of slavery, the interruption to African life of slavery we seem to be going back and trying to recreate what we could have been if there wasn't the slavery interruption. And I think now the generations seem to be becoming more African spiritual, you know, support of the ancestors and all of this kind of thing. What are your views on that? Do you think that that is something, do you agree that that's something that is actually becoming more prominent? And what do you think the reasons are for, for that? Yeah, I do think it's becoming more prominent, and it's interesting because it's something that you see at kind of critical moments in um, sort of black political history. You often see a sort of re-questioning and revising of religious identities, right? So that occurred in the 1920s um, with the rise of stuff like the Nation of Islam, right, a sort of rejection of Western Christianity and Western values. Then you see a rise of adherence to African traditional religions in the 1960s with the Black Power and Black Arts Movement. Again, a rejection of this notion that, um, you know, Western values is uh, sort of uh, primary or, or should be um, our top concern. And now we're in the wake of Black Lives Matter, mm -hmm. right? And, and many of the leaders of, of the Black Lives Matter movement in the U.S. Uh, were at, or are still adherents of traditional African religions. Um, and it's just a sort of political moment where that, that sort of raising up and um, prioritizing blackness and um, that historically has led to sort of religious innovation. Mm -hmm. Um, if you will, and, and kind of looking back towards uh, our African heritage and sort of reject, rejecting the inheritance of, of European religions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? No, just to agree, two of my uh, granddaughters are Muslim converts, and it's part of that rejecting the European, and because our, part of our family is Senegalese, and you know, Islam is um, is um, the religion of Senegal. It's like they've gone back to Islam as, uh, you know, as tr trying to kind of hold on to their uh, roots and a sense of community as well. They get, they feel part of this Islamic community when they never did part of the um, sort of Christian community. Mm -hmm. So... Last question. <laughs> Where do we go from here? We sitting here. We're black humanists. We're humanists. What's the what's the, what's the trajectory? What do we do from here? What is it? The one task you would send everyone here today to go off and do? What would you? What task would you? I want to give you an action. What action would you give people to do? 
<laughs> no, I think about asking a story. I think about it yeah. Yeah. all the time. So. But I think as, as humanists, we kind of we sit down there using all the information. I mean, your book is seminal. It's the kind of thing that you kind of look at and you say, as every black historian, as every black um, humanist, read this because you understand that you're coming from a long line. But also, mm -hmm. as we sit here, we are modern humanists. We are modern black humanists. Yeah. So, what is it that our legacy? What is our legacy going to be, and how are we going to move this? this movement or this idea on so that we are so that someone's writing about us <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> in future times and I suppose the kind of just kind of just thinking about how we then your book is here what do you hope that someone will take from it to be able to move it mm -hmm. I mean I, I hope somebody will take the fact that um, you know whereas a lot of um, a, a lot of historical white secularists have been able to divorce themselves from politics um, that has never been the case for black atheists and atheism uh, in the black community has always been intertwined with the black freedom struggle and that it, it should still be moving forward and that, that each of us can make some contribution to improving our world and be an example um, of what atheism can do right uh, in our sort of personal lives uh, and in um, in our sort of broader reality right and, and that example and, and just kind of talking to people about some of this history and um, telling everybody we can about it I think can can make an impact perfect big hand <laughs>